So the scripture this morning is going to be from John chapter 8, verse 31 to 36. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we're descendants of Abraham, they said. We've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean? You will be set free. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. I'm going to get back to that scripture here in a few minutes. I've got a whole bunch of them this morning. Um, but I want to talk about sin first. Because there's sin. We know, you know, we, we all know what sin is, right? It's um, taking something that's not yours, it's telling a lie, it's being angry with somebody and letting that give you bad <laughs> thoughts. But sin's more than that. Sin's anything that's keeping us from our relationship with God, right? Getting impatient with God to give us an answer and trying to create our own answer or find our own answer. That's sin. Not realizing what God's doing and thinking he's taking too long to do his thing so we look for an answer somewhere else in the world or in ourselves. That's a sin. Because we're putting something else above God in our life, right? You know, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 32, Moses was up on the mountain. You know, God had just given him a, uh, the Ten Commandments, right? But verse 1 says, when the people saw that Moses was so long and coming down, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses that brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. So Aaron told them to take off their gold jewelry. They did. He made a golden calf. They started worshiping it. Moses came down, got mad, broke the Ten Commandments. Right? God was really not happy with the Israelites right then. They got impatient. They forgot about the manna from heaven. They forgot about the parting of the Red Sea and then the Red Sea closing down on the Egyptian army. They forgot about everything God had done for them. They forgot about the Passover. They forgot about the plagues, the locusts. All these big miracles and the Israelites forgot about it because they were bored and they weren't in the promised land drinking milk and honey yet. Are we, are we guilty of that? I mean, I'm not saying you uh, took out your fur, your jewelry and, you know, made yourself a, an idol to worship or anything. But I've been thinking about it and I'm guilty of it lately. Our country is falling apart because of politics and because of the COVID-19. So people are, you know, acting out of fear, hiding from God. I get so mad at churches that aren't doing anything. Pastors that nobody's heard from in eight months. Bishops that pastors haven't heard from in eight, nine months. And I get so mad I want to do something about it. Mmm, you know, I want to. Mmm. God has a plan. I don't know what his plan is. But instead of thinking and praying and focusing on God and his plan, I let my thoughts run rampant about what I can do about vocational pastors that aren't trying to take care of their congregations. About bishops that are supposed to take care of the pastors that aren't. I'm not talking about our bishop, okay? Trust me. Our bishop is very much involved and engaged. But there are a few, even within the Methodist Church. But there are pastors, 
I've talked to people in this county who have not heard a peep from their pastors or their church. And it makes me angry. And then I see riots, you know, whatever they're based on, they turn into riots. People robbing and stealing. There was one on Facebook last night of people robbing a train. How is that looking for anything about equal rights or peace or love or anything else? Robbing electronics off a train while I'm going down a track. So that makes me mad and I'm like, oh, we should do something. That's the saying as the Israelites in Exodus getting impatient, wait for Moses to come back down with whatever instruction he had from God. So I'm not like, I should kill them all. Not that kind of sin, but I need to do something. No. That's my sin. Looking to create an answer to a problem that only God has an answer for. And we do that a lot. We forget about who's really in charge of this world, of this church, of our lives. We forget about God's grace. You know? We allow ourselves to be led into sin, getting impatient, and looking to somebody else to fix a problem. We get angry and bitter and blame politicians, and then we blame doctors. Well, this doctor said this, but this doctor said this, and they're all idiots. You know, and that's wrong with us. Because we allow it to lead us into in different sins. Doubting God. Living in fear. Anger. That's my, my big one. It, it always comes out to anger. And how do I know that anger and the hate we got going on is a sin? 1 Corinthians. Chapter 13. It's one of the first scriptures that Christine ever read to me when I became a Christian. Why? Because I had no love in my heart for anything, really. And I said, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but did love others, I'd only be a noisy gong. Or a clanging sound. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. <clears throat> Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or proud or boastful or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. Never loses faith. Always hopeful and endures in every circumstance. So if we're really Christians, that's how we should be reacting to everything going on around us, right? But we're humans, aren't we? And it's, it's impossible. I don't know about you guys, but it's impossible for me to be patient and love and be kind to people that are being less than loving and kind to the rest of the people around me. That's about the, about the only way I can put it that's, that's not wrong. And that goes back to the whole, we're going to sin. We know we sin. If you honestly think about it, there is not a person in this room, I'm pretty sure, that can honestly say that there are 1 Corinthians 13 Christian all the time. So we fail. Right? And that's kind of rough, but that's not really what I want to talk about this morning. That's a lot of talking and me getting long-winded to kind of get to what my point was this morning. God. God's grace. God, in the scripture we started with this morning from John, if the Son sets you free, you're truly free. Jesus was talking about, you know, being a slave to sin, and we are. We can't help it. We sin, and then we're stuck in it. We 
we can't fix it. When I tried to become a nicer person, and after Christine read me that scripture originally, way back, and I've told the story, and everybody thinks it's funny that I practiced trying to smile in a mirror, trying to be a nice guy, and then um, she came in and told me I looked psychotic and needed to quit. <laughs> she was not wrong. Because I was trying to do something. I was trying to change who I was. I was trying to rely on me to fix my problem. I wasn't relying on God to free me. I wasn't relying on Jesus and the Holy Spirit to put love in my heart that would actually show. So instead of a smile that you guys see where I actually am genuinely happy to see people, you guys have seen people smile like that. The mouth is kind of turning up, but the eyes are kind of squinting. They look like some kind of freaky mass murderer, right? And I, I wish I had a picture of when I tried to smile back then so people could see I'm not kidding. You know, it's important. We try to fix ourselves. We try to fix our anger. We try to fix our fear. It's not going to work. There's a, a country song and an old southern saying, hide your crazy, right? That's the best we can do is try to hide our crazy and our anger and our fear and our doubt from everybody else. That, that is the most we can possibly do. I don't care what every, you know, feel-good, self-help guru out there tells you. You can tell yourself in the mirror something over and over and over, and you might start to believe it, but in your heart you're still going to doubt it. We're still broken. We're still human. We're still slaves to sin. But Jesus came here to set us free. God gave his son to free us from fear, to free us from doubt, to free us from anger. We just have to believe. And not just believe that he really is the son of God. We have to believe that he loves us that much. And that's a struggle for some people. To believe that God could possibly love you enough to forgive all your mistakes. Romans 6 22, Paul wrote, Now you are free from the power of sin. You have become slaves of God. You can do the things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. If we let God lead us, if we let God make the decisions instead of trying to force decisions in our life, things change. You know, this morning during a prayer request, that young baby that was born with uh, brain damage, and, and, and that scares people. And they want to do all kinds of things. We'll take them off life support. A couple years ago, some of y'all remember, I, a friend of mine had a baby. And uh, bleeding on his brain, lungs were full of blood. And I drove down... And I'm no great prayer warrior, but I prayed for that young man hard with everything I had. I was begging God. That young man's, what, three years old, running around. And I got a call in the morning when I was getting ready to go back down and pray with her again that there was no blood left in his brain. There is nothing the doctors did at all to fix that. God did that. We have to rely on God to do that in our life. What's the sickness in your life today? Is it doubt? Is it fear? Is it actual sickness? Is it impatience? Is it anger with people around you? You know, in Isaiah 61... This is a quote that Jesus read in, uh, in Luke when he stood up to read scripture. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. When Jesus read that in, in Luke chapter 4, he responded, the scriptures you just heard were fulfilled this very day. 
God's grace is bigger than anything in my life. God's love and God's strength is bigger than anything that happens. You guys know I say a lot, yeah, but God won't give you anything more than you can handle. Yeah, yeah, he will. God will give you way more than you can handle. This broken world is way more than you can handle. That scripture follows with, he will always show you a path. God won't give you more than he can handle for you. Is what that saying should be. If you're trying to handle it on your own, all this hate and violence, it's more than you can handle. All this sickness and all the fear about being sick and all the doubt and wondering, and that's more than you can handle. It's not more than you can handle. It's not more than he can heal. Jesus walked the earth, he raised the dead. I've seen him make people walk that should be crippled. Me. I've seen people walk and get around that should have been dead in my life after prayer. And I mentioned earlier, every time I tried to pray this morning, I get interrupted. Somebody wanted to talk about something. Somebody wanted me to pray for them about something. And I would just get frustrated because I was trying to pray for me. You know, I was, I was sitting over here praying right before a sermon. I'm like, I'm supposed to be learning something. It's not all about me. When I'm praying, I'm praying. I'm in a conversation with God all the time. At least I'm supposed to be. God's grace is always there. For the Lord is the Spirit. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, is freedom. That's from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I've got a bunch more scriptures here, but it all amounts to the same thing. God's grace sets us free. If we really believe in God, and we really believe His Son, Jesus, is our Savior... We don't have to be in fear. People ask me all the time why I do some of the stuff I do, like kayaking down the road during a hurricane that first year I was here. Well, what happens if you die? If I really believe in Jesus, I mean, that's the least of my worries. If I die, I get to meet him face to face and ask him why. Why me? Why did you love me so much that you overlooked everything I did? That's the worst that can happen. Now, if you ask Christine, the worst that can happen is I do something stupid, get crippled, and don't die, and she has to take care of me and push me out of a wheelchair. <laughs> That's not that bad for me. I get more attention that way. No, uh... <laughs> Guys, we let the world and the mess going on lead us away from God and, and, and doubt. We shouldn't. God's been around forever. If you take a long, hard look at your life, you'll see times when God was there. We need to do that occasionally to remember, to remind ourselves how much God's actually done. We don't need to be like the Israelites in Exodus that overlooked all these miracles God had just walked them through and go, ah, well, yeah, we need a new God. This was not doing it for us. All we have to do is accept Christ our Savior. He's the Son. When we accept Him, we become children of God. No matter how unworthy we are, no matter how messed up we are, God's grace is bigger than that. And we're free. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to be angry. We're supposed to love. And I know it's impossible, we say, for us to love people that are rioting, burning homes, and hurting people. You guys have heard me say it before, we're supposed to love our neighbor, right? They're our neighbor too, as hard as that is. I didn't say you had to invite them to dinner at your house. But you have to love them. That's only possible with God in our heart. I want you to remember that. And this week, just lean on God. When you feel the world just burning,
breaking you down, when you feel doubt creeping in, when you feel that anxiety from everything going on, just turn to God. Remember, He's the only one strong enough for this mess. So let's be patient. Trust the God that's always been there for us. And let Him lead the way. Let's pray. God, sometimes we look at the impossibility of, of everything and it's overwhelming. It really is. You know, God, that we get weak. You know, even when we don't want to admit it, we get weak. God, we need you. We need you and only you. Only you can carry us through what's going on right now. Only you can carry us through all the, all the anger and the bitterness and the arguments about elections and, and racism and, and sickness, God. Only you can bring us through that. God, we need you to remind us that you're here. We need your spirit, God, to just fill us, take away the doubt and the fear and the anger. God, remind us that we aren't slaves to the sin of this world. Strengthen us and give us that reminder what we ask you, we beg you, please. We can't do this on our own. And Lord, I ask that if there's anybody out there, anybody that's struggling with it, anybody that's struggling with trusting you or knowing you, God, just find a way for them to contact me or any one of your children or anybody that knows you, God, so that we can pray for them, that we can love them, we can explain who you are, we can show them your love, open their hearts and, and save their souls, God. Lord, use us. We're supposed to be your hands and feet. Help us to really be your hands and feet. With all the social distancing, it's so hard. We need you to show us how. God, is only your strength, your, your grace, and your love is strong. 